I want you to imagine an orange and white striped fish swimming in a coral reef. He sees a boat and bravely swims towards it. And while he's told not to touch the boat, he touches it anyways. <laughs> then he's spotted by a diver and captured. OK, now wait. You may be asking yourself, is this talk about finding Nemo? Actually, what I'm going to share with you today is one way in which my research group is finding Nano could help safeguard our coral reefs. How many of you have heard of nanotechnology before? Well, you'll all know a little bit more about nanotechnology by the end of this talk. So what's nano? The official definition from the US National Nanotechnology Initiative, or NNI, states that nanotechnology is the understanding and control of matter at the nanoscale at dimensions between approximately 1 and 100 nanometers where unique phenomena enable novel applications. So you may not realize this, but nanomaterials have been used for centuries. Unlike bulk gold, which is yellow in color, gold nanoparticles can be red in color, such as in the Lycurgus cup, which dates back to the Roman Empire, or the stained glass from a medieval church window. Gold nanoparticles can also be orange or purple in color, because their color depends on the particle size. Seeing is believing, and it wasn't until the invention of the transmission electron microscope when we could see materials such as these gold nanoparticles synthesized in my lab at the nanoscale. So this year marks the 20th anniversary of the 21st Century Nanotechnology Research and Development Act, which created the NNI and made nanotechnology research a priority in the US. So now you may be asking yourself, are any nanoparticles widely used? Well, fun fact, if you're vaccinated against COVID-19, then the vaccine you receive likely contains lipid nanoparticles. And making the vaccine so fast was possible because of decades of research on this type of nanoparticle that was completed before the pandemic. All right, let me give you another example. How many of you use sunscreen? If the sunscreen's mineral-based, then the titanium dioxide and zinc oxide active ingredients are likely nanoparticles, which provide broad-spectrum UV protection and allow the cream to go on smoothly without leaving a chalky white residue. And so there are many other applications of nanotechnology, some of which are in your smartphones. And when we're developing new technologies, we want to get it right the first time. We want to ensure that the benefits outweigh the risks. And with these examples, I've told you a bit about the benefits of nanoparticles. What are the potential risks? So unlike lipid or zinc oxide nanoparticles, which are biodegradable, some nanoparticles degrade very slowly or may not be eliminated, which means once they're introduced into the body, they tend to stay in the body or are persistent. So because cells work at the nanoscale, for example, DNA is approximately two nanometers in diameter, the longer nanoparticles stay around in the body, the greater the chance they could do something that we didn't intend for them to do. So now what if your doctor came to you and said, we have this nanomedicine and it can treat your disease and afterwards the nanoparticles are gonna remain in your body for the rest of your life. Would you proceed with the treatment? It's a tough question and helping to quantify the risk is an area in which my research group strives to contribute. My group is thinking of other ways in which nanotechnology can help address global challenges. And recently, my research group asked the question, can nanomedicines be developed for corals to help them stave off the effects of heat stress? Why heat stress, you ask? Well, have you seen the headlines from this summer? So starting in April this year, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, detected a steady increase in the ocean temperatures off the coast of Florida. Come July, the Florida's ocean temperatures had exceeded the historical maximum average temperatures for one month. And in one area, Manatee Bay, the temperatures had exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius, which is quite warm. And so then corals like us prefer more ambient temperatures, such as 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. 
However, unlike us, when it gets hot, they cannot move to cooled spaces, they're stuck. And it's the stress that they experience during these marine heat waves that is a primary cause of coral bleaching events, and in some cases, massive coral death. Okay, so what is coral bleaching? So corals are beautiful and unique creatures that live in symbiosis with algae, where the algae lives inside the coral tissue. And so both share nutrients with each other, and the algae gains shelter while the coral gains color. And so coral bleaching is a process where the symbiotic relationship breaks down and the algae are expelled from the coral tissue. When this happens, the coral loses its color and its skeleton becomes visible from underneath. And so under heat stress conditions, corals are also observed to have increased levels of oxidants, such as reactive oxygen species, which can cause coral bleaching. And oxidant imbalance can also lead to diseases in us as well, which is why you may have heard some diets are promoting you to eat foods that are rich with antioxidants. And nanoparticle that has been extensively studied in the biomedical field for its antioxidant capacity is cerium oxide nanoparticles, or nanoceria. So the nanoceria that we synthesize in my lab have diameters of approximately four nanometers, which is quite small. Just look. Can you see the atoms in the nanoceria crystal in this image taken with a high resolution TEM? Isn't it amazing? And so we wanted to know whether nanoceria can protect corals against heat stress by reducing the reactive oxygen species. And so we tested nanoceria in the symbiotic algae and found that the algae take up the nanoparticles and this didn't affect their growth. We also found that the nanoceria does indeed reduce the reactive oxygen species in the algae under heat stress conditions, which is a pretty promising result. And then as a potential delivery method, we tested whether the algae containing the nanoceria could reinfect corals using a sea anemone as a model. And we found that they do. And so this is pretty exciting, and we're continuing this research to see if the nanoceria produces the same effects in reef building coral species, as well as to determine how long the nanoceria treatment is effective for. And we also envision other ways in which nanotechnology can help corals, one of which is delivering compounds that can accelerate coral wound healing. And so before any of these technologies can be used in the ocean, we want to test for safety. We want to develop technology responsibly, and we don't want to cause more issues by prematurely adding nanoparticles, which are chemicals, into the ocean. And so this involves careful testing to understand not only the beneficial effects, but also the conditions in which potentially detrimental effects could occur. So when do the benefits outweigh the risks? Well, there's no crystal ball or artificial intelligence that can predict the unknown. But if we can figure out how something happens, such as toxicity, then we can figure out how to make it not happen. And we cannot let the fear of failure or messing up paralyze us from trying out new ideas. Being able to control matter at the nanoscale opens up so many possibilities for creative solutions to climate change. What's so scary about nanotechnology anyways? So just like Nemo's dad went from being fearful to being more trusting and adventurous, we too could be less fearful and more trusting of the teams of scientists and engineers, designers, artists, and others who are working together to push the boundaries of our knowledge. It is up to you and every one of us to create the future we want. Thank you.